What's up guys, it's Dalmater here, and today we're going to be reacting to a new channel, one that I have not reacted to before. Uh, this one is Arbiter Ian. Uh, I think out of the Warhammer channels, it's probably the second smallest one I've reacted to, so if, you, if you're not familiar with him, go uh, give him, you know, a subscri subscription. Uh, he's only got about 70k, which is, you know, much more than me, but still pretty small. Um, and this is the evolution of power armor, every mark from 1 to 10, Warhammer 40k lower in 20 minutes. So... Obviously, this is about the, you know, the evolution of the power armor throughout the 40k uh, history. So, again, link to the original video but down below. If you haven't checked him out before, be, go sure, be sure to go check him out. Uh, this is my first reaction to him, so I'm, I'm, you know, but people had recommended it to me, so I'm assuming it's pretty good, and let's jump into it. Of the most iconic images of Warhammer 40k is the space marine clad in power armor, the highly advanced futuristic plate armor available to warriors of the Imperium and used not only by the space marines but also by the Sisters of Battle, the Custodes, the Sisters of Silence and many more. But what exactly is power armor in 40k and how has that silhouette we're so familiar with evolved over the 10,000 years it's been in use? So power armor is one of the most effective and advanced forms of armor used by warriors of the Imperium in 40k. Over its millennia long history there have been loads of different styles, marks and variants created for use by the giant genetically engineered soldiers of the Astartes or Custodes or for more human sized warriors like the Sisters of Battle. But all these different marks have a few things in common. At its core, Imperial power armor is plate armor, a suit of armored plates drilled into place around the wearer. These plates are usually constructed from layers of ceramite, an extremely tough ceramic material used by the Imperium as both the source of armor and for military construction, and that's particularly good at absorbing energy and heat-based attacks. Each of the plates that make it up is formed from layers and layers of ceramite, which may be constructed over something else, like an adamantium or plasteel base or sometimes made from something completely different, like the Auramite armor used by the Adeptus Custodes, but Ceramite is the standard, and results in an extremely durable and very heavy suit of armor. It's basically made of stone. Power armor suits can weigh hundreds of kilos. But this weight is offset by the systems that give the armor its name. Each suit is built over a layer of electrically motivated fiber bundles that mimic the wearer's own muscle movements, usually by means of some interface with the wearer's nervous system. Not only do these fiber bundles help move the colossal suit of armor, but they also amplify the wearer's own muscle strength, enabling them to hit with more force in close combat, become a more stable firing platform for heavier weapons, or even just move faster. The armor then comes with its own generator to power all this, often in the form of a backpack. <clears throat> so I, I actually, I didn't even realize there was a generator on the back there. I always just thought it was a jetpack. Because I mean, when you look at it, it just looks like a jetpack, but that's actually pretty cool. What are they used to gen like for their generators? Maybe I'll get into that. At this basic level, power armor is extremely complex and ridiculously expensive, well out of the reach of most Imperial citizens, and so it's usually confined to elite or extremely well-funded military forces, or special operatives like Inquisitors, whose power armored suits are often custom builds just for them. But as well as these sophisticated defensive technologies, power armor also includes lots of auxiliary systems. It's common for suits to be environmentally sealed for operation in inhospitable environments environments or in the void to contain sophisticated respirators and filtration systems or their own air supply, as well as protective visors, flash suppressors or audio dampeners for better operation under battlefield conditions. Suits often also include auto senses, advanced augurs and scanners, heads up displays, night or infrared vision capabilities, suites of tactical communication equipment and automatic threat detection systems. The different power armored suits used by the agencies of the Imperial might be of very different specifications, including some or none of the above equipment, but the pinnacle of Imperial power armor is probably the various marks developed for the use of the Space Marines. Space Marine power armor is a... Let me go back to that for a quick second. Power armor is probably the... All right, so we have <clears throat> Mark 1 Thunder Pattern, Mark 2 Crusade Pattern, Mark 3 Iron Pattern, Mark 4 Maximus Pattern, uh, Mark 5 Heresy Pattern, Mark 6 Corvus Pattern, Mark 7... Aquila pattern, Mark 8 errant pattern. So are, are the patterns specifically for that uh, mark or do can they have like any pattern, any mark? 
is the pattern just like the some of these look like some of it just looks like a paint job a little bit and then others like there's actual like modifications like you can see this guy's got like little beads all over his this is like a golden eagle golden skull this guy's got a little fucking helmet various marks developed for the use of the space marines space marine power armor is a colossal construction designed to keep its occupant operating at peak efficiency for as long as possible and to enhance the prodigious abilities of the space marines inside it as well as much heavier plating than other patterns space marine power armor includes medical sensors and injection systems it carries on board high density nutrient stores to sustain the space marine within and even has sophisticated waste filtration and recycling systems a space marine can operate for months at a time without needing to remove the armor i'll leave the implications of that to you the armor's completely void sealed and its greaves and boots include mag locks to allow the wearer to fight in zero gravity environments. But the biggest technological advantage Space Marine Power Armor has is actually within the Marine themselves. The final implant given to new Space Marines as they graduate the scout companies is the Black Carapace an organic fibrous material that sits under the skin of the marine's torso and meshes with his nervous system along with the numerous connection points implanted across his chest back and arms this means that the marine's connection to his armor is much more sophisticated than other forms of power armor behaving almost like a second skin and allowing him much more natural movement within it the science used to create all this is ancient and has its roots in the dark age of technology when mankind spread uh, the age of strife lasted approximately 26 to the beginning of the 31st, roughly from 2500 to 3000 or 30,080. Um, in 5,000 years, the ancient pan galactic human civilization. Uh, I guess I can't read the entire thing because it cuts off here and then goes up here out amongst the stars various stcs from that period managed to survive the following age of strife whether in the form of the sophisticated exo armor used by the leagues of votan or the much simpler devolved powered suits used by knights of the order on caliban and remnants of those technologies could be found on terror itself oh yo this is cool america the name of the country is just america so obviously oh wait so this is all the water that's left? Interesting. What happened to all the fucking water on Earth? So old Albia, Albion, Franc, Europa. I love how Europa is like just the Mediterranean, basically. Germany, except spelled different. Nordic, Kievan Rus, Cognate. Uh, Terawatt clans, Uratu, Akhamid Empire, Avisna. It's interesting how many of these have kept their name. Like, at least a version of their name. Himalaysia. Jade Citadel of Hongul. Safrica. So, so, Safric, South Africa. The Rad Wastes. Yeah, like Brazil kept its name, America obviously kept its name, even though it seems to have been pushed up to what is now mostly in Canada from the looks of it. Um, yeah, Albion's obviously a reference to Albion, fucking Thulean Ice Basin. Albion's obviously a reference to, you know, Britain's old name, Alba, or Albia. Um, Europe, but yeah, Europa's mostly... The Mediterranean, and then we got Mediterranean Dust Basin, North Africa Conclaves, Mid Africa Hive Polity, Achaemenid Empire, obviously the Achaemenians, the fucking Persians, the Nordics, the Kievan, Caucasus Wastes. So, what happened to all the water here? dating the rise of the Imperium, like in the ironclad regiments of old Albia. As the Emperor started to unify the planet in the 31st millennium, these technologies were adopted and improved upon by his scientists for use in the Imperial armies, notably by the Legio Custodes, the Emperor's elite bodyguard, and the Legiones Cataigis, the thunder warriors that formed the spear tip of his army of unity. And it would be their armor, Thunder Armor, that formed the first mark of power armor adapted for use by their replacements, the Space Marines of the Legiones Astartes. 
These suits, retroactively designated Mark I, were simple by comparison to the later marks of Space Marine armor. Thunder armor consisted of an extremely heavily armored ceramite torso section powered by an auxiliary backpack supported by more conventional, often unpowered, armor on the legs. The fiber bundles in the top half of the armor gave the wearers using it immense upper body strength, apparently useful in the close quarters bloodbaths that were the Unification Wars, but the suits weren't fully enclosed and didn't have many of the life support functions of later armors, stuff that just wasn't as necessary when the fighting was confined to ancient terror. This sort of armor would have been used in various idiosyncratic local patterns by the earliest of the Space Marine Legions deployed at the end of the Unification Wars, but as the Emperor unified the solar system and made alliances with Mars, Imperial and Martian scientists started work on a replacement, something that better suited what the Astartes were created to do. Mark II armor, known as Crusade armor, was the first true Space Marine power armor, developed by the Mechanicum in the forges of Mars and issued to the growing Astartes legions as the Great Crusade got underway. Crusade armor was a fully enclosed suit, void sealed and with full life support capabilities and with all of the auto senses and auxiliary medical systems that would become standard over the years to come. It was fully powered, including the legs, and exposed cabling was minimized, moved behind the main breastplate or to the back of the leg armor. The placement of power cabling was a major concern for every mark of the armor and would be solved in various different ways over the years. The suit itself was constructed of hooped sections, which gave much greater maneuverability than the old Thunder armor. At the cost of being slightly more difficult to maintain and repair, and being much heavier, the backpack generator was made much more efficient to power all this. This was the standard mark of power armor used by the legions at the start of the Great Crusade, and the distinctive helmet with its mono-slip visor became a symbol for the Astartes across the galaxy. By the time of the Horus Heresy, it was technically outdated by newer marks, but many legions and companies still made use of it. It was still widely considered one of the most efficient patterns of armor available at the time, despite being a bit more difficult to maintain. Mark II was in use for so long that it spawned a load of variants. Most legions had their own variant designs and patterns, but one of the more common variants is what would become known as Mark III, iron armor. Mark III is a development of Mark II armor invented early in the Crusade in an attempt to make a heavier form of protection for full-on frontal assaults. Iron armor added additional plating over the top of the Mark II's hoops and replaced- Yeah, you can already see it starting to cover more of the face and stuff. It seems a lot more pragmatic. The helmet with a new design with a sloped faceplate to deflect incoming fire. This additional armor was mostly oriented towards the front. And while it made the suit heavier, less efficient, and less maneuverable, <laughs> This guy's arm looks like it's missing, but somehow he's got a sword. I don't know if it's just covered in dust or... It was perfect for the brutal boarding assaults it was designed for. While it was originally considered too clumsy and uncomfortable for general issue, most legions still used some form of iron armor, often assigned to breacher teams, and some of the more direct legions, like the Death Guard or Imperial Fists, favored it, enough that the variant was officially designated Mark III and was seen pretty commonly alongside Mark II as the Great Crusade pushed on. And as the Crusade pushed on, various fragments of lost technologies and STCs were rediscovered and the development of power armor continued. Towards the middle of the Crusade, the Mechanicum started work on a replacement, a new version of power armor for general issue to the legions. This new Mark IV armor, named Maximus armor, was the most technologically advanced so far, making use of newly discovered systems and materials. The new suit removed the large abutted plates of previous marks in favor of form-fitting plates linked with flexible joint sections, marginally less maneuverable than the old Mark II, but much easier to produce and repair. The armor quality was improved, offering greater protection despite the suit itself being lighter. The newly armored power cables were moved back to the outside of the plate, and the suit had a much more efficient and smaller backpack generator. Mark IV was intended to be the final form of power armor required by the legions, and most legions were at least partially reissued with it, but by the time of the Horus Heresy, the reissue wasn't complete, and some legions even preferred the previous heavier version to this new, more efficient one. But it was still one of the more common armor marks seen across the legions, especially amongst traitor legions, since Horus as Warmaster was able to somewhat control supply lines, and it's still one of the most common of the older marks seen in the 41st millennium, with some chapters still favoring it over the later ones. 
The Horus Heresy then pushed the development of power armor down a number of different directions. At the outbreak of the war, the legions were equipped with a mix of Mark IV and Mark III armor and some Mark II suits, but as the war ground on and armor was destroyed or worn out, the legions were forced into using stopgap designs or combining parts in unorthodox ways. These ad hoc suits could vary greatly, but a number of solutions became so commonplace that an entirely new mark of armor was accidentally invented, retroactively named Mark Mark V or Heresy Armor. Mark V is based on the Mark IV template, but it's most... <clears throat> okay, so the... Uh, what are the, the patterns at the start actually are... That is what the armor is called, okay. Because, yeah, this was the one that was called Heresy, and it's obviously still called Heresy, so... Visible addition is the use of molecular bonding studs designed to reinforce the layers of ceramite against the Astartes' own armor-piercing weapons and allow additional layers of ceramite to be added on top. This increased the weight of the suit, requiring the backpack generator to increase its output, which meant that the suits could be uncomfortably hot. The helmet design was also modified, using technologies originally intended for the Terminator armor project and giving Mark V its distinctive mandibles in the form of this mantilla pattern respirator. By the end of the heresy, this patched together sort of armor was one of the most common ones seen. In fact, in some places it had entered into mainline production to keep up demand. But after the heresy, many Imperial forces dismantled these suits as they were resupplied with new ones, considering them ill-omened as well as inefficient. But Mark V still sees heavy use amongst Chaos Space Marine warbands, and its rugged technologies are still employed by the more remote and isolated of Loyalist chapters. As well as the stopgap that was Mark V, the Heresy also had effects on the mainline development of Space Marine armor. Mark IV had been intended to be the perfect armor, but Mechanicum research continued, eventually resulting in a suite of advancements that improved overall efficiency and power routing. This prototype suit was originally intended to be called Mark V and was tested by the Raven Guard Legion during the Scaland campaign, which led to it being known as Corvus armor, named after their Primarch, and then eventually designated as Mark VI. Mark VI armor was the lightest form of mainline Space Marine power armor. It offered no significant improvements in protection on Mark IV, but its systems were much more modular, easier to replace, and more compatible with the earlier marks. Components could be swapped out easily with less advanced versions in a pinch, and it made- It's like a metabot. <laughs> Anyone ever seen that, that show? It was such a- I haven't watched it in years, but I remember it being a really good show when I was a kid. But uh, yeah, they had like the robots that would battle, and you could like switch parts on any of them good use of the same molecular bonding studs that were seen on Mark V, this time on the facing shoulder guard. Some of the power cabling was moved back behind the plating, and the armor was quieter than any of the previous versions, which made it particularly suitable for stealth work. The new helmet design with its distinctive conical nose also housed advanced auto sensors. These suits first entered general issue near the very end of the Great Crusade, and every Space Marine Legion made use of them to some degree, but as the heresy broke out, its modular nature, backwards compatibility, and ease of repair meant that it quickly became the more common form of new power armor issued, and the one most commonly seen on the masses of hastily created inductee pressed into service during the war. As a result, it's a relatively common form of armor even in the 41st millennium. At the same time, Mark VII armor was being developed on Mars. While visually quite different, and with a new helmet design that owed a lot to the previous Mantilla and Sarum pattern respirators, the new Mark actually shared many of the same components as Mark VI, making them extremely compatible in case of replacement. But Mark VII finally moved all that exposed cabling back underneath its armor, the decorated chest plastron which gave its armor one of its most common names, Aquila or Eagle armor. It's also occasionally called Imperator armor. During the heresy, as Mars fell to the traitors, the Imperial Fists evacuated the stock of prototype Mark VII and its development teams to Earth where they continued work, which meant that by the end of the heresy, many of the Loyalist forces defending the palace had been reissued with this mark, and it became something of a symbol for the Loyalist Space Marines, eventually becoming the standard mark of new power armor issued to Space Marine chapters for the next 10,000 years, as much a symbol of the Imperium as the Space Marine within it. As the Imperium tried to hold itself together in the wake of the heresy, research and development continued on the armor, but only in a limited form. Mark VIII pattern armor, dubbed Errant armor, was a variant of Mark VII with improved chest and neck plating, but the new raised collar acquired a new helmet design that made it less compatible with earlier marks, so it only ever saw limited production. It wasn't until way later, during the Indomitus Crusade of the 41st millennium and the resurrection of the Primarch Robert Gearman, that Space Marine power armor saw its next 
major improvement. Mark 10 power armor was designed in secret by the Mechanicum Archmagos Belisarius Call for use by the new Primaris Marines. Named Tacticus Armor, Mark 10 is developed from a mixture of technologies taken from many of the older power armor marks, including a faceplate that owes a lot to the advanced Mark IV. It's also designed as a modular system. The different armor segments can be swapped out depending on the battlefield role required. The lighter weight elements of the armor, adapted for silent running, can be used to create the Mark 10 Phobos patterns used by Reaver and Vanguard Space Marine units, and the addition of heavier plating can turn the armor into the Mark 10 Gravis pattern, used by Aggressor and Inceptor squads. As Primaris pattern Space Marines become more and more common across the Imperium, Mark 10 has become the new standard pattern of power armor, but the galaxy is a big place and true standardization is practically impossible. There have been loads of lesser known marks or prototypes. Yeah, I guess when you're trying to get it across like tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of light years across, the, you know, the universe. Well, I guess technically they're only in their own galaxy, but, you know, across the galaxy it can be difficult to standardize anything. And let alone like with all the weird time stuff that goes on, like people getting trapped in the warp for like, you know, periods of time and then they come out and it actually hasn't been any time. It just felt like a massive amount of time to them or vice versa, where they get trapped in the warp and they come out and it's been like 500 years, but to them it felt like five minutes. Type sub patterns over the Imperium's history. Imperial pattern armor was an extremely early variant design with a downsized power pack and conical helmet, much like the later Mark VI. Local forge worlds and chapter armories also developed their own preferred components, particular patterns of helmet or styles of decoration unique to the chapter's culture. And unique artificia suits might be created for specific individuals, like the runic armor used by Space Wolves rune priests or the Aegis armor worn by the Grey Knights chapter, We're built from a combat of Mark 6, 7, and 8 designs, and covered in hexagramic wards to protect the wearer against the powers of the warp. Even with the reinforcement of the Space Marine chapters in the 41st millennium, making completely new suits is still an expensive and time-consuming effort for a chapter forge, and so armor's often repaired and reused rather than being replaced. And over the millennia, some of these suits have become revered artifacts of the chapter's past. It's common to see Space Marines clad in a mix of armor marks, and chapters might reserve whole suits of ancient armor for use by honored veterans or elite units. Other chapters make deliberate use of older marks of armor. I mean, <laughs> that's kind of weird, but I, I guess it, it kind of makes sense maybe if it was like used in a ceremonial way. But it's like, hey, you're best soldiers, we're going to give you our worst armor. <laughs> Although I guess if you see it as a holy relic, maybe they have like some... You know, the, the God Emperor is gonna like bless it and they won't get damaged. Armor. Like the Red Scorpions and Minotaurs who still retain the ability to produce suits of the advanced Mark IV, or chapters like the Carcharodons who operate far from any resupply and who value the durability and simplicity of some of the earlier marks. And of course, these older marks of armor are still incredibly common amongst the warbands of the Chaos Space Marines. Heretic armor might be derived from millennia-old suits of Mark III or Mark IV plates, modified by the influence of the warp and replaced over time with newer components scavenged from defeated foes or augmented by supplies from loyalist chapters that have turned renegades since the heresy. And all this might be held together using the same <coughs> hasty stopgap techniques utilized during the heresy. Like much of the Imperium's technology, power armor is both a relic of a previous time and a symbol for the power of the Imperium as a whole. It's a technology built from constant rediscovery and innovation over a couple of hundred years, and then largely left untouched as the Imperium stagnated over the next few thousand. And even with the reinforcement granted by the Primaris Marines, that's still the case in the 41st millennium. Power armor and its distinctive silhouette is as much propaganda as it is a defensive system. A status symbol wielded by the Imperium in memory of a past they can't quite reach. Turning from a mass manufactured, almost disposable asset of conquest to a rare holy relic, surviving suits carefully husbanded over the millennia, hoarded by the Imperium's wealthiest agencies, and the knowledge of how to create it, like much of the Imperium's technology, carefully guarded lest it be lost again. Thanks for watching. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, so obviously you have a mix of reasons on why they developed these, right? Originally, you had the ones that were developed on Terra to, you know, conquer Terra and and unify Terra. And then as they started to spread out, a lot of them were made for the Great Crusade and the different, different things you needed in the Great Crusade, like, you know, fighting in the vacuum of space. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of get to like the, the middle tier. I think it was Mark IV that he was talking about. Maybe, yeah, I think it was Mark IV. It was either four or five. 
uh, where it was created during the heresy, basically, of people patching together different sets of armor and using different pieces from different armor because it was so hard to get supplies. And then as you get more, you know, uh, some of the more advanced ones, especially the Mark X, it's, like, unifying all of these technologies. But it seems like they're constantly trying to find this balance between, like, you know, having something that's light and efficient um, and something that is, you know, durable and not going to get blown up. Which, I guess, you know, in, in many ways is kind of, like, the same as, like, tank technology, right? A lot of the time you have this... Uh, you know, kind of balancing act you're playing with like a lot of tanks and a lot of airplanes and a lot of different stuff like that, where on one hand they want it to be, you know, as close to indestructible as they can, right? Because they, you know, you don't want your crew to die because that's like t years and years of training a new crew. You don't want your machine to be broken because, you know, that's, you know, millions of dollars. But at the same time, so you obviously want to build something super defensive, but at the same time it has to pack a punch and it has to be able to move quickly, which means that the availability of what you're going to do for defense is obviously much more difficult. So, you know, whoever, you know, decided to, like, do the lore on the power armor, like the guy that actually made it or the people that made it, it's it's interesting how well they did it because they did a lot of parallels when it comes to, like, real-world technology and how we apply it to military situations. Um, but, yeah, a, a great video. Um, again, this is from Arbiter Ian. link will be down below. Be sure to go check him out if you haven't already. He's only got about 71,000 subs, which, you know, it's got quite a bit more than me, obviously, but uh, still a relatively small channel, so be sure to check him out. And uh, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.